Yo, yep, 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 yep. Welcome, 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 welcome back to the Art of Advocacy. Brought to you by Leading Equity Center and also brought to you by Leading Equity, Become an Advocate for All Students. By the way, if you purchased the book and you read the book and you enjoyed the book, you know, it'll help a brother out if you just jump on Amazon one time and just give me a nice little review. You know what I'm saying? I, I would appreciate that. Why not? You know, if you can. If you enjoyed the book, man. If you didn't like the book, don't give me no one stars, man. Don't do a brother like that. That'll be messed up. But I would appreciate any support. By the way, if you're out there, feel free to say hello. Um, it's always great to see who's who's listening, who's watching the live stream. We go live every Thursday at 6:30 Eastern, 6:30 p.m. Eastern. So tune in, tune in. Make sure if you're not already, subscribe to the channel, follow the show. Uh, hit that like button. Smash that subscribe button like they always do on YouTube. Go ahead and do that for me. I appreciate that. I'm really excited because we got a good special show. We're going to be talking about diversity in our books, and we're going to be really specific about that. So Cami is waiting in the back room. I'm going to bring her on in just a moment as we get ready to do that. Um, but I'm really excited for this topic. I love the title, and that's where we'll start. We'll start right there. Well, that would be the first question I ask her is, just kind of asking, you know, tell me about the title because she came up with that. You know, that wasn't my idea. I wish I was that creative, but that's just not my skill set. So I just I just bring the content to you when it comes to the creativity, the titles and all that stuff. I struggle with that. So uh, but I'm really excited for this opportunity. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Cammy. She and I were talking just a little bit before uh, um, we got we decided to go live. And she's in South Florida, which I think is pretty cool. I used to live in Orlando. Shout out to those who uh, live in that area in Florida, folks. Now we got a lot of stuff going on in your political realm. But shout out to you, though, because your weather's nice. So I'll give you that one. Give me that. And, and gators, not Florida gators, but actual gators in Florida. You have to assume that every body of water has a, a gator in there somewhere. That's just one of the things I learned when I lived in Orlando. Okay, now. Cami Hughley currently serves as the manager of training and development at Fluent Seeds, a nonprofit form to promote early learning and literacy through Seeds of Learning, a set of relationship based early literacy and language frameworks based on the latest science of reading. So, without further ado, I'm going to bring to the stage Ms. Cami Hughley. <laughs> Like sound effects, I see that. I see that. Welcome, yeah. Cammy. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Oh, pleasure is mine. I am glad you are here. Now, I share. I read like one sentence of your bio. Now, I would love for you to share a little bit about yourself and what you currently do. Awesome. So, thank you again. So, my name is Cammy Hughley. As Sheldon stated, I serve as the manager of training and development for Fluent Seeds, which is a nonprofit that was created to promote early learning and literacy using Seeds of Learning, which are a set of relationship-based frameworks based on the science of reading. So prior to serving um, as this particular in this particular role, I've served in other nonprofits as either an instructional coach or a manager. And I started my trajectory in education as a classroom teacher. I primarily taught pre-K, more specifically, Head Start. So early literacy and young children are my jam. Early literacy and young children are your jam. No, don't get me wrong. I love some young kids, but I can't teach young kids. So I just don't have the patience. So <laughs> and it's not for everybody. Could you could you see yourself maybe as a secondary you teacher? You know, I, I did teach high school for a hot second. Um, and I enjoyed it, but I prefer the little ones. I really do. To each their own. And, and, and that's fine. We, we need folks to get them started, plant those seeds. Now, I'm curious about uh, Fluent Seeds. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about what Fluent Seeds is all about? So Fluent Seeds is all about relation building relationships. And the SEEDS is an acronym. It stands for Sensitivity, Encouragement, Education, um, and develop, um, develop through doing. And by doing, by adults embodying those characteristics, it helps children to develop a positive self-image and supporting them in their literacy. Dope, dope. All right. Now, the title of today's, today's show is Why Ain't No Black People in This Story? Bias in Early Childhood Settings. I love the title. Can you give us a little bit of background? How'd you come up with that? 
So I did not come up with it. This was an actual question that a student asked me, one of my pre-K students, back during the 2014-15 school year. So let me set the scene. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading a, a book to my students during story time. Story time is one of my favorite parts of the day. Again, I love literacy. And so I'm reading this story. Can't remember at the moment the name of the book. Um, and I was working with all black and brown students, 19 students, black and brown. And as I'm reading the story, I'm mean, asking the questions, supporting their comprehension. And one child, a black boy, raises his hand and says, and asks, Miss Hughley, why are no black people in this story? And in that moment, I literally, I froze because I, First of all, I didn't realize that there were no black people in that story. Um, and a whole nother conversation just came about um, with that one question. So this student who asked the question was a very light skinned African-American boy. And one of the other students said, wait, but you're white. Mm. So these four and five year olds are having this conversation about, hey, you're white because his skin was fair skin. He was fair skin. And so it wasn't an argument, but it was like, no, I'm, I'm not white, I'm black, <laughs> I'm, I'm black. And the kids are like, no, but look at your skin. And so one student says, I got it. He's not white, he's, he is black. He's just Creole, like Beyonce. <laughs> and I'm like, how did we even get here from why no black people in the story to a debate as to what color this child, what race this child is? So mm. this is a class of four and five year olds. And contrary to popular belief, like young children at the preschool age, they start developing a sense of racial identity and they start yeah. ascribing characteristics, be they positive or negative, to a race. So hence you can get a child to say, hey, why no black people in this story? Or, well, your skin is this color, so you must be this race. Mm. So how I'm curious, how long ago was that? Who that was, I want to say 2014, 2015. Okay. And so let's, let's call it seven, seven years ago. Yet that is still on your mind today. Now that moment. So here's the thing that I, I think about when those kind of conversations, especially with four and five year olds, I know a lot of teachers will just shut that conversation down early on. Like as soon as that whole, you know, you, you're not black, you're white and all, you know, why are there, that to me would have got shut down by a lot of teachers. What what led you or why was it so important for you to let the conversation continue? One, I can't, you know, I don't, don't want to be the smart or be noble about it, but honestly, it kind of took away some attention away from, oh shoot, I didn't recognize there are no black people in this story. Mm. And so that was a great question to um, I guess, divert my ability to be able to not be able to respond. So uh -huh. that that's the first thing. And also, I really believe in allowing my students to think through what their thoughts are. And so I think about it as, as time has gone on, I thought about um, Dr. Goldie Muhammad's book, Cultivating Genius. And Dr. Muhammad talks about supporting children and developing their criticality, which is their ability to be able to not only like name, but to interrogate the world around them. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment, I didn't realize that's what I was doing. I was just really interested in diverting from me not knowing as the adult how to respond and also being very interested in, hmm, what are they thinking here? Like, where is this going to go? I got you. I got you. Uh, and and it's, you know what's interesting? Because I didn't learn about like culturally responsive teaching and all those things till later on. But it's one of those things it's like, man, a book comes out or just you get a, a someone tells you about something. And it's like, man, I've been doing that. I just didn't know it was called something. Exactly. And so, so it sounds like that was one of those type of experiences for you in that in that classroom. Yeah, like I, I, I just always thought it was really important to bring into my classroom like my students and their lived experience and really highlighting that and allowing them to be their true authentic selves. But like I said, I didn't know in the moment that that's what I was doing. I, I think it's just a signature of good teaching, like mm -hmm. allowing students to feel comfortable to express themselves and to bring themselves into the space. Okay. Now 
we're going to talk about literature and you know we're in a, we're having this conversation in the midst of book bannings mm -hmm. uh just all kind of things happening with in your state as well yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> all the things you hear are true <laughs> all the things you hear are true you know florida man is real it's, it's, it's happening down here you know I, now listen i love florida like i said i've lived in florida you know, so i'm not i'm not here to roast but let's keep it real. There are there. I mean, I live in Idaho. I mean, we ban books too. I mean, we're, we're trendsetters as well. Um, but in the midst of all these things, uh, I know there's teachers that are out there that think literature, especially diverse books, when it comes to you know the reading and, and starting early, early on is very important. I, I'd love to kind of get your take. Like, why do you think that books or diversity in books is so important? Okay, so you may have seen like this infographic from like, I think it came out in 2018 from the University of Wisconsin-Madison talking mm -hmm. about diversity in children's books. So there, they conducted a study, this study, their school of education, let me make sure I get it right. University of Wisconsin-Madison School of Education Cooperative Children's Book Center, also known as CCBC, did this study in 2018, looking at diversity in children's books they looked at over 3,000 children's books, and essentially, it was determined that a lot of children's literature is not are not very diverse. For instance, so out of those 3,000 plus books they looked at, 50% of those books had white characters. 27% mm. of those books had characters that were animals or some other object. Um, and for children of color, the numbers get more dismal. 10% of those books had um, African or um, black characters. 7% um, had Asian, Pacific Islander Asian characters. 5%, yep, Latin, Latinx characters. And 1% had American Indian First Nation characters. Mm. So this is important because numbers oftentimes tell a story, right? When we see um, a large number of something that indicates value and importance. So this communicates to me that uh, a ch uh, an Asian Pacific Islander Asian child is more likely to see a talking duck or a talking bear in a book than a reflection of themselves and their experience. And so if I'm going throughout my schooling, especially my early childhood primary years, and I'm mostly exposed to books with white characters or animals or trucks or ducks that talk, that may be communicating to me that one, my lived experience and who I am is not valued. Or two, I become so accustomed to not seeing myself reflected in literature and in books that I start to internalize unintentionally that type of oppression. You know, what's crazy is, I mean, I'm looking at that 1% American Indians, First Nations, 23 books. That's it. Just 23 books. Out of over 3,000? Yeah, out of 3,000. And then, like you say, uh, you know, we're we were more likely to see books with animal characters than with people of of color. So, I read or looking at these stats, folks, or and actually, Cami, looking at these stats, what do you know where we're at in 20, 2022? Is there like an updated one that I should be trying to Google right now? I was looking for an updated one, but I couldn't find one. But mm -hmm. I. I I do remember seeing like not much has changed there. This is the most recent one. I think another one came out in 2015. Mm -hmm. So this was a little bit of an improvement from 2015. From 2015. Okay. So people see, you know, and I saw, I remember seeing this. I actually saw this for the first time back in March uh, when I was at someone's keynote and they brought this on screen. Uh, and so, so I wasn't aware of this until then. And I mean, I'm not a literature teacher, uh, so I just, it just hadn't come across my purview, but uh, what kind of impact does this have on our young children, on kids in general, when these are the stats and, and hopefully things are better in 2022, but w what type of impact does this have when, when, when the, there's so little representation? I think it can have an impact on one's self-esteem or when you do encounter a character that looks like you, a little bit of shock. So mm -hmm. for instance, in a former role that I had, uh, we administered an assessment to children. Um, I remember I was working with this tutor who was administering the assessment. The tutor mm -hmm. 
was a young black man. The child was a, a pre-K student, four-year-old black boy. And in that particular um, assessment, it was in a storybook format. Mm-hmm. And so the storybook had a picture. It was um, uh, a black father and a black son at the beach. And I remember the tutor flipping through the pages. And on the pa- one of the pages was the little black boy at the beach. And that little boy said, dang, that boy's black as me. <laughs> and so I'm not sure if there was a little bit of colorism there or he was just shocked. But for that child to highlight, hey, this is a little boy in this story who looks like me, that really stuck out to me to let me know that this may not be an image that he's accustomed to seeing mm-hmm. in school. He was in, we were in a school setting, sitting in the classroom. So he may not have necessarily been used to seeing a child in a storybook who looks like him, let alone um, along the lines of his skin tone. Mm. Okay. Now, here's the thing. I, I got to give a shout out to my good friend, Dr. LaWanda Wesley. She brought this to my attention. Well, let me ask you, let me ask you this question first. And then um, I'll, I'll tell you what she shared with, with me. And she, I've heard her say it a couple of times uh, when it comes to diversity books, is that enough? Finding diver- If I'm a, a early childhood, if I'm a teacher, whoever, whatever my role, librarian, you know, it's bringing in a bunch of diverse books. Is that enough? No, <laughs> because <laughs> I don't think it's enough because I have lots of questions about that. My first question would be, um, what's the content of the books, right? Mm-hmm. Are these books, yeah, you have books with lots of black and brown characters, with children of color represented, but what stories do these books tell? Are these stories that highlight um, children's humanity, their joy, um, their love, or are we highlighting their marginalized status? So the first time that uh, an Asian child sees themselves in a story shouldn't be about Japanese internment. Mm -hmm. The first time a black child encounters a book, that's reflective of them shouldn't necessarily be about slavery. So what stories are we telling and who's telling these stories? Like who's the author of this, of this particular text? What message are they trying to convey? Yeah. And that's a good point, right? Cause people say, Oh, I brought in diverse books. So I got Rosa Parks story, Ruby Bridges. I got, uh, you know, Dr. King, you know, so there's that representation. Oh, the kids can see folks that look like them. But yeah, but what, like you said, what story is being shared? And like you said, that should not be the first encounter that they're getting. And not only that, what about children highlighting stories of people with disabilities or who learn differently or who mm-hmm. think differently, right? That's that's also diversity as well, helping children understand. And that's the power of books. Books can really help children um, develop empathy and understand that um, the way they view the world isn't necessarily end all be all. There mm-hmm. are other ways of being as well. And that's also important, not just for children of color, but for white children as well, to understand that there's different ways of being, there's different types of people, and we're all worthy of love and respect. So going back to what I was gonna say before, Regarding my good friend, Dr. Wesley, uh, LaWanda Wesley, she talks about, okay, not only just the stories that are being told, but also what type of occupations do the families have? Are the kids living in apartments? Are they living in mansions? Are they li- like, what, what are they living in the hood? Like what type of setting is available for the, these characters? And then the other thought is, Okay, family structure, like the traditional family structure is what, you know, a mom, a dad, maybe two kids and a dog. But, you know, that's not the typical family structure for a lot of families. You have blended families, you have same sex families, you have all these different types of families. Should that be something that we're intentional about when it comes to finding? Okay, so we're saying we're going to find diverse books. But should we also be intentional with, again, looking at occupations, the settings, um, those type of things as well? I think so. And even down to um, colorism as well, because there's colorism mm-hmm. in children's books as well. Sometimes mm-hmm. in books with children, with characters of color, um, I've seen the, the father is darker than the mother, um, that type of thing. So I think we have to be very cognizant of that because children... They're, they're taking in all these messages. Like sometimes I think we as adults think children are these tabula rasas, they're these blank slates. 
Like, no, they're, they're taking in information yeah. in the world around them and they're ascribing meaning to it. So how are we supporting them in developing their critical thinking skills to understand like, hmm, there are different ways of being and that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's okay. I, I agree. I agree. Um, and and unfortunately, it's not necessarily a thing that we can consider or, or think about. So let's let's shift over to the book banning because um what we just mentioned were all these different types of books that kids should be exposed to. However, there's a lot of legislation out there that says no kids should not be exposed. I was watching a YouTube video. Uh, this week, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, and I, I, I hope I don't mispronounce his name, but Tanahishi Coates, I believe, is how you. Yes. Okay, that's my guy. I love his book Between the World and Me, um, and so his books have been banned. And what he said, I thought, really kind of resonated because he was basically saying, you know, the whole idea of indoctrination. But if you're saying that you only can read the books that I approve or that I agree with. That is actually the indoctrination there. So why do you think these books are being banned? Like in your opinion, because you're 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 in it, you're you're doing this work. And, and if I'm if I'm putting you in a bad spot, let me know. But I'm, I'm just curious. <laughs> I'm just curious. Why do you think these books are, are being banned? Ooh, trying to choose my words. <laughs> <laughs> I think with we we've in the last few years we've seen strides in legislation with various groups of people um rights being advanced and mm -hmm. as a particular administration has come um into purview and gone out of purview kind of mm -hmm. um I think there's been this kind this, of kind of I mean, kind of there's been a backlash <laughs> uh, against progress and okay. progress for some people is very scary Sure. And so I this this whole I'm like starting to itch a little bit. This whole concept of indoctrination I, I find really interesting because, for instance, I I'm I'm a heterosexual woman. I am married to a man, to a cisgender man, and I got married in 2014. I was a, a Head Start teacher. So when I was getting married, I was I told my students like, hey, I'm getting married. I'm not going to be here on these dates because children like predictability and I want to let them know I'm not going to be here on these dates, right? Mm -hmm. So they would ask me questions about my husband, right? So is that indoctrination because I'm sharing with them, you know, I'm getting married on this day and they want to see my dress. They want to see a picture of Mr. Anthony, right? Is that indoctrination? Some might consider no. indoctrination, right? I don't think so. But... I've seen teachers who were lesbian, who I, I, there was an article or a woman just won a case where she was getting married as well and sharing about her partner that she was going to be marrying. And it was at a Catholic school. And, and as a result, she ended up taking a lot of heat and a lot of backlash um, from parents and, and the, the administration, all these things. So it's OK. Or we would say it's often acceptable when it's when it's traditional or heterosexual type of relationships but then when we start putting in same sex relationships or trans relationships and things like that then th that seems to be an issue mm -hmm. um <laughs> so <laughs> I, I i and it's not even just that you know there there was that one you know anything that has to do with race these days have been have been banned as well uh, again is it a form of indoctrination or is it a fear like uh, people will claim that it's divisive, you know, we're, we're further perpetuating racism and all these things by reading these type of books. But I argue, I think it's very important that we need to share or, or teach our kids at an early age. If we want things to end, if we want racism to stop, we need to start engaging in these conversations early on. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts? I'm going to, I'm going to share another story. I like stories. Yeah. Um, one of my yeah. first, I think my first and second year of teaching, um, I taught in, in Maryland, taught Head Start. So my students this time were three and four years old. And I was reading them the traditional story of Goldilocks and the three bears, right? We all know the story. Three bears, mama bear, papa bear, baby bear. Goldilocks goes in, essentially breaks in <laughs> their house 
he spared the porch and brick up the furniture. So I had an observation that which day. we don't talk about, by the way. She straight up broke break in right. the entering B and E. Right. That's five to ten. But anyway, I'm sorry I cut you out. Go for no, it. No, no, you're good. <laughs> so I'm reading this. I'm reading, you know, first or second year teaching. I'm, I mean, I'm doing the things. I'm asking the questions, and I was being observed by my principal. So my principal had my lesson. So um, I'm reading the story, asking them questions, and I get to the end of the book, and these 15 kids are looking at me. They just look real unhappy. And so I put the book down on my lap and I was like, hey, <laughs> I'm looking at your faces. You don't look happy. It's, what's, what's wrong? And one little girl says, we, as if they consulted with each other, we don't like this story. Hmm. And I was like, oh my goodness, this is not supposed to happen. I'm being observed. Like, whew. We don't like this story. And another child says, yeah, I don't, I, I don't like it. And so I asked why, like I'm flabbergasted. Like, why don't like, what's, what's up? And one child I'll never forget says Goldilocks is mean. Mm. And I thought like, oh my gosh, in this class, we talk a lot about kindness and being good and nice and, and, and being friends with each other. And so they were internalized and Goldilocks was mean. Um, and one boy said, yeah, she went in their house. She broke their stuff and she ate their food. That's not nice. And that just blew up my whole lesson. And I was like, all right. In that moment, I had to pivot. And we started, mm -hmm. instead of what I had planned, I, we started talking about, well, what are some things Goldie, they could have, the bears could have done to keep Goldilocks out? Answers were great. They need a, they need a gate. Um, Goldilocks needs a whooping, like what you like, Goldilocks needs a whooping, right? And so I tell this story to say that that is an opportunity for ch in, in in developing children's criticality, as Dr. Goldie Mohammed stated, that is helping children be able to interrogate the world around them, to actually look at social injustices and not only just be able to name them, but to think and problem solve around them. So if we, if we don't acknowledge that there are actual injustices, how can we actually not just navigate them, but work to transform and change them? Wow. And that's, books are an opportunity for that to happen. That one little story in reading Goldilocks and the Three Bears, that helped my students to be able to understand like, wait a minute, this what's happening here with Goldilocks and these bears. I don't like it. Let's talk about how we can make sure this does not happen. You know, I, and I like because a lot of these these books are, are, you know, these quote unquote classical books. We don't always think about like, what is the story about? Some girl breaks into uh, uh, someone's house and eats their food, sleeps in their bed and eats the in their us. I never looked at that story like that. Never. I was like, oh, this is so cute. I think <laughs> it was part of my curriculum. Yeah. And never, I, I didn't look at it like that. And they were just like, no, ma'am, we don't like this. So are you in favor of books that should have like some sort of moral to the, to the story type of books? Or are you more interested in representation and how things are represented in books? Ooh, I think, I think there's space for both. I, I think there's an, there's all different sorts of books. There are, of course, you know, fiction, nonfiction. There are wordless picture books. There are rep repetitive books. Um, there are informational texts. And I think children should be exposed to all forms of text. So they not only, they're just not, not that they're just getting the exposure, but we can figure out, like, what do they actually like? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm sure you've encountered children who just, or adults, I don't like books. I don't like to read, right? And I think it's, it boils down to, have you found that one book that you like? I, I truly believe that children can develop a love and a joy for reading if they're exposed to different genres and different types of books and books with different types of artwork and illustrations, right? But if they don't have that exposure to different types of books, they'll never be able to determine if, why well, I truly don't like reading or I just haven't found that one book or type of book that I like. Okay. I'm going to ask you another question because it's on my mind. Um, I are you familiar with accelerated reading programs? A little bit. Haven't been exposed to them in some time, but okay. It's, it's kind of like reading comprehension. So you read a book, 
uh, a child reads a book and then they take a test and then based on how they do on that test um, determines, you know, what kind of score they get. And so a lot of schools will utilize the AR test scores as part of their grade. Um, and so I know that there's a lot of kids that, you know, so then you're so, so I'm often I don't want to say this incorrectly because I'm, I'm not an elementary teacher, but I've seen where like kids are kind of pushed more to do chapter books because they're worth more points than just kind of like a smaller book. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like sometimes that might take away some, some of that joy that you were talking about or, or the, the, the idea of wanting to read because now I had to read this chapter book versus I, I like this other one, but I got to get these points. So I, I was curious if you're familiar with AR um, because I, I had those are some of my thoughts in, in my experience with dealing with those type of books. Hmm. So when I was thinking of AR, I was thinking about it when I, and this may not be AR, but mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, when I was in elementary school, like, I think it was like, if you read a certain amount of books, you would get like yeah, yeah. a prize or a treat. Pizza right? hut thing. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I was thinking like, yeah. I'm, I remember, you know, I, I was a voracious reader. I still am. So I remember just, I mean, I would just like rip through books. Mm -hmm. But I don't even know if I even understood what I was reading. And so yeah. that's my fear because essentially reading is comprehension. If you're not, if you don't understand what you're reading, you're not really reading. You're just essentially a, a word caller or just, just, or just speed reading, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, the whole point of reading is being able to understand what you're reading and to be able to think critically about what you're reading. So if that's for me, like what is the end goal of AR? Like, right. Like what, what, what are we really trying to do? They normally have like a, a goal, right? So let's say, okay, for the semester, for the, the quarter, we want you to get a goal of 20 points, right? So again, depending on what grade you are, what, what reading level you're at, uh, each book is worth a certain amount. And so your goal might be to get 20 points or it might be 15 points or something like that. And so if you don't hit that goal, then you come up short. And then so that that's part of the process of a child. But what's the learning outcome? Okay, I got I got all these points. And does it make me a better reader? Did am I reading if, if I right if I were reading below if I was reading on grade level, now I got all these points. Am I above grade level? Like what is the learning outcome? Like what are children taking away from that experience outside of points? Like mm. that is that is meaningful. Because I mean, to some extent, the points are meaningful, but does that improve their reading comprehension? I think about the equity level too, right? Because you got kids who, even if you check out the book and from the your school's library, your classroom library, um, you have kids that are involved in, you know, maybe they had to babysit the younger child, a uh, younger sibling or somebody. Uh, maybe they're involved in sports or act, after school activities. Uh, and so then you have other kids who are more able to read books uh, and can can really utilize, you know, gain those points versus other kids have other things maybe that are happening outside of their school and to, to which that might hinder their their opportunities to read so much. Uh, so I kind of think about that. That's usually where my mind goes when it comes to these type of things, just from an equity lens. Um, and again, I don't necessarily think that it gives you an accurate reading or reflection of someone's comprehension skills. Uh, based off of just, again, cramming, you know, I don't want to say cramming, but just reading books, taking comprehension, because you could still do their Lexile score and it might say something different. But if you look at their AR points, it's, I don't know, I just have a lot of thoughts on that. So right. and to your point about, um, um, act, like I think um, you mentioned about um, students having different various activities or reasons that mm -hmm. may hinder them from that. Socioeconomic yeah. status plays a yeah. big role. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and literacy acquisition skills, right? So we know from research that children from, typically children from higher from a higher socioeconomic status, they tend to have, even just outside of just having access to books, they have more access in general to yeah. broader experiences that they can utilize as background knowledge in book reading, right? Mm -hmm. So before they even open a book, there's there's an equity issue there. Wow, what, I didn't think about that. Access has this child. Okay, so if we're reading for another, I love stories. Another example, I worked um, at an affluent preschool one summer, and these every week there was a different um, 
focus area. So one week the focus was on space. Mm-hmm. And I walk in, and these are three and four year olds. I clearly I love three and four year olds. So these are three and four year olds, and the we had to read a book about space to open up the week. So I'm like, in my mind, they're three, they're four, I don't know nothing about space. Yeah. yeah. So I remember asking before I opened the book, what do you know about space? Miss Cammy, my mommy and daddy took me to Kennedy Space Center. I ain't never been to Kennedy Space Center. <laughs> <laughs> right? Miss Cammy, um, Pluto, Pluto used to be a planet, but it's not a planet anymore. Yeah, yeah. The stars in the sky are different colors, and that tells us how hot they are. Mm. This is these are four. You said these are three and four year olds. Yes, yes. Okay. And that that's what made me go get a master's in reading because I was like, <laughs> I need my head start babies to be able to exactly, have to exactly. Support them and having this background knowledge before I even opened the book, they had that mm. background knowledge. So I'm like, well, what about to read this book before <laughs> they just told me yeah. everything? Right? So, and, and these were children whose parents um, were of a high socioeconomic status. So even before we opened the book, they had so much knowledge that they could apply to, their, to me reading the story to them, right? And so that, that gap starts even before reading be, uh, official reading begins. I didn't even think about the, the vocabulary le- level or understanding uh, you know, it goes back to the testing bias when, you know, we talk about and bias and how a lot of these tests can be culturally biased because, you know, a child may not understand what sofa means. You know, the little boy is sitting on the sofa because he might use the word couch instead. Uh, and so just like little type of words that a kid may not be as familiar with. I know there was a question about uh, an oboe, right? So like the, the child plays the oboe, but like, a lot of kids don't know what an oboe is and they don't know symphony and all that kind of orchestra or whatever. These little things that they may not be familiar with. And it sounds like you you had a prime example with three and four year olds. Yeah, I, I've also seen that in the test thing as well. Like here in South Florida, we might call flip flop slides. Right. Or flip flops, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But you don't say flip flops and you say slides, you don't get it. But I mean, what are we really assessing their knowledge or the word they actually say, right? Mm. They know what they, they can identify, but they're not using the word that is directly and specifically on that assessment. Absolutely. Okay. Now, let me ask you this question because I, audiobooks, okay? So where do you think audiobooks fit in the conversation, early childhood books? Do you prefer kids to read them themselves are you pref- like what are your? I see you moving. Oh, there. I'm, I'm curious. What what are your thoughts there? Okay, so the point of reading to young children, I'm thinking out loud, is to model fluent reading. Right? We want them to be able before they can formally read in the formal sense. We want them to be able to hear what it sounds like to be a reader, like the cadence. Mm-hmm. I think audio books can be a tool, but they have to be used very carefully. I, I okay. think. They can be a tool, but they shouldn't be the only tool that teachers utilize for children to have exposure. Because some some kids may really gravitate to audio books, right? But Mm -hmm. what's the point of reading comprehension? Are you planning your read aloud to pause at certain points and ask them questions to make sure they're really listening to it? Because some of these audio books, they sound like movies. (laughs) They they sound like whole feature length films. Are you as a teacher, you using this as a little bit of break for yourself, or you're using this as a different type of experience for your 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 diverse learners. Hmm. Okay, I I didn't. Okay, you're again. I don't teach. <laughs> so, because I'm like, I never thought about this. That so, uh, could teachers be possibly utilizing audiobooks as a kind of like a break? Which you know, not that they don't deserve breaks. But again, I taught second grade one year. I don't know how folks do it. <laughs> I, I I wish I had known about that. I probably would have used some audio books for some breaks because tell you what, that tattle talent is no joke. So I, I get it from that sense, but it's not something I never, th- I, that I've thought about. I, I just think, you know, cause I, I have special ed background. Mm-hmm. And so I think about it from a maybe IEP level or maybe 504 type of situation where we want our kids to be able to engage. Cause I know teachers will tell me, oh, my kids can't read that. Uh, that that's above their level. And and so I'm like, I'm just thinking about options. 
So I saw your face. Now I kind of want to ask you about. Well, true. <laughs> I kind of want to ask you about that now. Yeah, and it's it's it, and I, I've had that in other roles as a coach, working mm-hmm. with you know people in you know in classrooms who may or may not have never worked with students. Say, oh, I don't know about you. You know, reading this book, I think the vocabulary is above yeah. them. What's the harm in exposing it to them? Right. Think mm-hmm. about. Think about those three and four years I talked about in regards to space, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't think they knew anything about space, but at some point they've heard it, they've had exposure to it. So why can't we give all children that equitable access to exposure? Because we never know what they may gravitate to or or, or really take on unless we expose them to it. There's no harm in exposure. Absolutely. Shout out to Davina. Davina, I'm glad you joined us. She says, uh, yes, unfortunately, I have seen it. There are no instructional informed intent at times when teachers are. Uh, teachers use audibles. However, audibles allow all learners to access knowledge and content. There has to be an informed intent in any resource use. What do you I think? Love the intentional has to be intentional. Are you planning just like you would plan your regular read aloud? Are you planning when you're going to stop? ask comprehension questions, give students the opportunity to turn and talk to one another. Like it has, there has to be a plan behind it. Not, yeah. you know, shoot, this, this audio book is 15 minutes. So I'm going to give a <laughs> minute break, breather, right? You just, <laughs> it, it, no it, one's doing that. No, no one's doing that, Cam. No one's doing that. You know, but if that's the case, just turn the radio on. If that's what you're going to do, like, just let them, right? There has oh, to be, there has to be listen, an okay. behind In that. The in the age of COVID teaching, and thank you, Davina, I appreciate you for, for hanging out with us today. Um, in the in the age of, of COVID teaching, I mean, it's, it's we got a lot of folks that are trying to figure out, like, when do I get these breaks? When can I kind of get some time to myself? Um, and so we, we do what we got to do to survive because, yeah. you know, mental health to me Absolutely. is very important. And so I don't want to take that away from anybody, especially when you're, you're having a hard time. But I, I, did, I was curious because... Again, I hear those comments. Oh, I don't want to teach this book or utilize this book because my kids can't read it. And I like what you said, Cammy. You talked about like before y'all even started reading the book on that space book, uh, you asked them, what do you know about space? And then allowed the kids. And, I, and, and would you recommend also that maybe you should put maybe some definitions, uh, some some key terms maybe with before you start reading those books as well? I mean, what are your thoughts there? So one of the things that I do in my work and see as part of the model is with repeated read alouds is mm-hmm. explicitly teaching vocabulary. So pick okay. out essential vocabulary from the text and teach it, create child-friendly definitions mm-hmm. and teach that word, teach those words very specifically and intentionally. Okay. It's about intent. Intent. Okay. So now not you and not use as a break but also be be intentional with our approach to to learning. Okay, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Now, you know, I have thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, Cami. Um, Is there anything that we have not touched on in regards to diverse books that you want to bring out? Um, One thing I wanted to bring out, again, was the point you made about are are diverse books enough? No, and I think... As adults, before we open up a book, we have to explore and maybe undo and unlearn some things that we have about diverse books. Like, so before you, you know, you you get all gung ho after listening to this, and you're just like, oh, I really want to um, bring in more diverse books. Mm-hmm. Do a little bit of unpacking of your own biases. Like, start thinking about why do I want to do this. Uh, what types of books do I want to introduce to students or let other people know about? And um, just really do your own homework on who the authors are and what the intent and purpose behind those books really are. And, and really start working on thinking about your own biases, especially if you are a preschool teacher. I think sometimes mm-hmm. in the early childhood space, we think of it as this, you know, this paradise of just warmth and happiness. But there's bias there, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so start th- because, you know, the studies show that, you know, Black preschool children are more likely to be suspended or expelled, right? So there's, there's bias even in that space. So really start working on unpacking some of your biases. What would you say is your favorite book to recommend for any early childhood 
a teacher out there? Oh, one of my favorite books. I really, okay, so this is probably, y'all might be like, oh, can we go on like almost like the audiobook route? <laughs> so there's this, <laughs> there's this series on Netflix called Bookmarks. It's called Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. Have you heard of it? No. It's called Bookmarks Celebrating Black Voices. And that it is um, like it's a one season series of black celebrities reading um, children's books by, by black authors. Um, like Tiffany Haddish is reading a book about hair. We have Caleb McLaughlin reading the book um, called Crown. Um, uh, Grace Byers reads her book called, um, gosh, I know the name of the books, but it's a great series. I love all those books there. So I think that would be a great start. Just So it's almost with the audiobook route, but they are actual books but it's like celebrities reading the books. Okay. Like, but it and it's and it's children friendly. And it's child friendly, yes. It's, it's okay. Beautiful. The animations are gorgeous. They actually show the book. Um I really love Lupita Nyong'o's book called Sulwe. Mm -hmm. um, beautifully written. But yeah. oh, I can't pick just one. So I think that series is a great start. So I was just I was online um maybe it was Facebook and I even saw a video as well. Uh, Ken, Dr. Kendi has a new one, a newer one called the Good Night, the Good Night Racism. Um, mm -hmm. It's as a take on Good Night Moon, uh, which is supposed to be a, a children's book. And I think he actually had his daughter read the audio version of the book. Um, have you seen that book being utilized in classrooms, uh, or, or would you recommend that book being utilized in classrooms? I might be a little biased. I'm a fan of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi. So uh -huh. I, I like all of his work. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I would, I, I would, but I understand in some places that may not be allowed. Yeah. Uh, I definitely would recommend any of Dr. Kendi's work. Yeah. And, and, and not in, in those kind of situations, not just for the teacher and the, and the student, but also, you know, as parents, I think those kind of books are, are helpful. A, a book that I, I like to recommend is, um, uh, uh, man, I'm going to say it cor incorrectly because I don't have it in front of me, but it's like it happened in our town. Um, mm, yes, I've heard that one. And that one's about like you have two families. You have a white family, you have a black family. And there's a police brutality situation that happens within the town. And the book talks about how the two different families basically discuss what happened. And oh, something happened in our town. I, I don't have to look it up. I'll find it. I've heard um, of it. I know yeah. that. I can see the illustrations right now. Yes, yes. And I think that one's a good one, especially when you're thinking about prejudice, uh, not pre prejudice, privilege, uh, and and just kind of in police brutality and those kind of conversations. Again, I always tell people, because people tell me, oh, they're too young to to talk about these type of things at the, you know, four and five years years old. It's just way too early. But I say, no, there's there's ways that we can have those conversations. It's gonna obviously look different for a four-year-old versus a 14-year-old, but I think we're doing our kids a disservice if we don't introduce a lot of these concepts early on. And not only that, sometimes they they bring us the concept when we're not ready to answer, mm -hmm. right? They bring certain things to us, and it's just like, okay, just like that child asking, "Why are no black people in this story?" Right. We have to have the tools to be able to respond. And sometimes in the moment, you don't know how to respond. And I think as adults, we have to move past like, "I'm the adult. I know all the answers." And really mm -hmm. model for children, hey, or be vulnerable enough to say, you know what? I don't know how to answer that right now. Let's think through how can we find the answer to that. Let's work on that together. Mm. That teaches problem solving skills. Like, I don't have all the answers, but let's work together to have the answers. Or let me get back to you on that and really do get back to them. <laughs> really do get follow up. Follow up. Don't, don't be one of those. Follow up, okay. Like, really get back to them. Oh, man. Okay. Cami, I definitely consider you as providing a voice and leading equity. I'd love for you to share one final word of advice to our listeners. Ooh, one final word of advice. Um, sometimes it's really scary when you are trying to learn something new or teach something new, but I encourage you to lean into that discomfort. If you're uncomfortable, that means you're on the right track and you're stretching yourself. And the children that you work with, um, that you're around, that you live with, that you're raising, that you're teaching will be all the more better for you stretching yourself 
and exposing them to diverse literature. All children will be will be better off. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we have some folks that want to connect with you, what's the best way to reach you online? The best way to reach me online is through LinkedIn. Uh, my name, which is somewhere on the screen, Cami Hughley. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. It's on my phone. So feel free to send me a message and I'll do my absolute best to respond in a timely manner. And if they want to connect with Fluent Seeds, how do we get there? Um, our website, I should know this off the top of my head. The website is Fluent Seeds. Forgive me. <laughs> I should know this. The website is Fluent. I'm not trying to get you fired, by the oh, way. No. It's Fluent, F L U E N T Seeds, S E E D S dot org. Fluent dot org. Dot org. Got it. All right. Well, Cammie, it, it was truly a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. That was fun. Had a great time with Cammie. Um, as we wrap things up, just blew my mind with a few things. Just, just the idea of even our three and four year old children, they might know more than we know. So the idea of saying that you're, you know, my kids don't, you know, I can't, I can't, can't have them read this book. It's beyond their level. And you might be surprised. You might be surprised. So not only is diversity in books important, and one of the things that we did not talk about that I just now thought about is the representation also in authorship is very important as well. So you want to find diverse books with, with characters and things like that, but also you want to find books that would represent it by people who may have those same lived experiences. And that's the one piece that I forgot to ask. So um, other than that, I really enjoyed this conversation. Teachers out there, let's stay at it. Let's do our thing. Remember the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Let's continue to be a voice in leading equity.